Beautiful. I love seeing where everyone is coming from. So once again, if you're just joining us, we're just asking that you go into your chat box, um, send a message to everyone saying where you are Zooming or watching from, how many people are with you, and what is your favorite bird? Up, oh, so Massachusetts, Newton, Mass. My parents grew up there. Fantastic. Great. So uh, thank you all so much. If you're still logging on or in the middle of typing, please do so. But we are just going to get started into the webinar now. But great job. In this webinar today, we are going to explore raptor adaptations, learn the different families of raptors, learn the steps to identify raptors, and most importantly, learn why we should be conserving these beautiful animals. We are just getting at the basics of raptors in this webinar. But as we go along, you'll be able to tell you can really dive deep into identifying them because they can be kind of tricky sometimes, uh, especially in flight. So we're going to be identifying some common raptors you can find almost anywhere in North America, depending on what time of year it is. So the next time you want to go birding, hopefully you can add some raptors to your life list. So we are going to get our brains working this morning. In the chat, please type out any adaptations or qualities that raptors have that make them different from other birds. And a quick definition of an adaptation is something that helps a plant or an animal survive in its environment. So I'll give you about 30 seconds or so to type in your thoughts. Oh, I see wings, sharp beak, talons, amazing vision, strong claws, talons, strong and big, good hearing. Some are quiet in flight. Fantastic. Keep uh, writing in your answers. I can tell we have a, a great group of people with us today starting to know our raptors. So here are some of the things that you all had said. Binocular vision. So bino means two. They have their two eyes with an overlapping field of view, which allows for good depth perception, which means they have really good eyesight. So when they're flying up high, soaring above, scanning for prey below, they want to make sure when they dive down to get that little rabbit that they're not crashing into the ground as well. You might have also heard that eyes in the front hunt, eyes on the side hide. As you can tell, the, the first picture up top of that great horned owl is staring right at us, giving us that perfect example of the eyes in the front. A lot of you said hooked beak, very sharp hooked beak. You can tell in our picture of the golden eagle on the left hand side, she has a very, very sharp beak. They use that kind of like a knife to rip up their prey. Strong talons, a lot of you mentioned that. Great job, everyone. This is so that they can actually grab their prey. They're super strong. And you can kind of think of it like a fork stabbing into that food. And if you look at that bald eagle flying, holding onto that fish, it's a great example. The bald eagle's grip is believed to be about 10 times stronger than the grip of an adult human hand and can exert upwards of 400 PSI, that's pounds per square inch, onto them. So that is very, very strong. Uh, and it varies throughout the raptors as to what that strength looks like, but they are very strong. And then finally, they are usually a carnivore. They tend to eat meat, not tend to, they do eat meat, uh, whether it's rabbits. Um, they're not going after plants with all these amazing adaptations. And a fun fact, the word raptor 
is based on Latin words referring to seizing or plundering. So that's why a lot of the definitions have focused on the grasping raptorial feet, especially of hawks or owls, as a defining characteristic. Beautiful. Great job, everyone. So our raptors are divided up into families. We have the families listed here on the side. And it's actually just really interesting to note that there has not been a universal agreement on exactly which birds should be included under that term raptor. In the December 2019 issue of the Journal of Raptor Research, eight experts proposed a new definition. Christopher J.W. McClure and his colleagues looked at recent advances in the high-level classification of birds to find a grouping that uses actual relationships. McClure and co-authors define raptors as, quote, all species within orders that evolved from a raptorial land bird lineage and in which most species maintain their raptorial lifestyle as derived from their common ancestor. So <laughs> what that basically means uh, in practical terms is that that definition would exclude most orders of birds and would apply only to these orders. And please excuse me, if I stumble upon some of the names. <laughs> the Accipitriformes, which are your hawks and your eagles. The Strigiformes, which are your owls. The Catheartiformes, your new world vultures. And your Falconiformes, which are your falcons and caracaras. So that is something that was just put out there. Uh, we will be seeing if the scientific community kind of latches onto that definition, but it's just really cool. And you see on our slide, the top picture, we have kind of a kettle of red-tailed hawks, and the bottom, that is our American kestrel. And you can see they're broken up. Something interesting to note is that within the hawks and vultures, the Accipitridae family, that includes our eagles, so keep that in mind. So moving on, we're gonna be going and diving into each family a bit more and learning about their characteristics. So owls, we all know them, whether they are on the big screen, like in Harry Potter, or you just think of them when it's Halloween, they are quite the magical, mysterious birds. So take a moment and please use the chat window again. And what are some characteristics you think of when you think of owls? What are some of their adaptations that might help them survive? And the two owls that will be watching you during this, the top is a picture of a great horned owl, and the bottom is our flammulated owl, or some of us lovingly call the flam flam. Great, big eye, silent flight, owl pellets, interesting digestion, asymmetrical skull, Heads turn around, disc face. Great job, good hearing. Beautiful. So you can keep typing in if you'd like. These are some of the main ones that we have. Like you said, a lot of them are mainly nocturnal. That means they come out at night. However, this does vary upon the, the bird. Some of our owls, like burrowing owls, come out in the daytime, so they're diurnal. Or some might be more at dawn and dusk, which would be crepuscular. They are our carnivores again. Uh, our larger owls tend to feed on mammals such as rabbits or skunks, and smaller owls a lot of the time stick to the insects like grasshoppers or crickets. The circular facial disc that kind of gives them that roundish shape when you look at them on their face, what's really cool is they have control over them. And it goes with their asymmetrical ears. Someone had mentioned the word asymmetrical in the chat. Great job. 
Uh, that means their ears are on their different sides of their head and one is positioned higher and one is lower. Now, once again, that varies upon the species of owl with how far apart they are. But basically, what this allows them to do along with using their facial discs is they can tilt their head, turn their head, and essentially triangulate and pinpoint exactly where that moth or that mouse is that they want for food. So fantastic hearing. <laughs> uh, silent flight someone had mentioned. What's really cool about that is if you were to look up closely at the owl's wing, its leading feathers, on the edge of them, it, I think it almost looks like eyelashes. It's almost serrated. And what that does is when they go to fly, that's the first part that hits the air and it breaks it up. So it results in a much quieter sound than if you were to think of like a goose who, if you were to look on the leading uh, feathers on their wing, would just have a blunt side along down. Uh, large eyes. They have very big eyes. Uh, if you were to make a fist right now and hold it up kind of gently in front of your eye, this is kind of how big your eye would be if it were an owl's. It would be huge. It takes up a lot of space. Owl's eyes are actually conical, so they're cone-shaped, so it doesn't leave a whole lot of area left in the skull, and it doesn't let them be able to move their eyes around. They are stuck, so we can make crazy eyes. Hopefully you all are making crazy eyes right now. Owls cannot, and that's the reason at the end they can turn their head 270 degrees, so almost all the way. And one of the reasons why they can do that is because they can't move their eyes, so they just can't simply look over with their eyeballs. They have to turn their entire head. If you're to bend down your neck and feel the back of your neck and feel your vertebrae, you would notice that we have seven vertebrae in our necks. Owls have 14. Combine that with the fact that they have something called contractile reservoirs, so a place that actually pools their blood because when they turn their head, they're actually cutting off that blood flow. But having these con contractile reservoirs allow the brain and the eyes still to get blood. So full of amazing adaptations. Great job, everyone. Next one, hawks and vultures. So same thing, uh, don't forget eagles are also in this family, but take a moment and use that chat window. What are some of the characteristics you think of when you think of this family? Hawks, vultures, and eagles. A couple of examples we have is we have our turkey vulture above and a sharp shinned hawk below. So I'll give you about 30 seconds or so once again to do type in your answers specially shaped tails and wings, strong, good eyesight, soaring, carrion, sharp eyes, strong, long wings. Perfect. We have a bunch of ornithologists on our hands. <laughs> so once again, you can still type it in. Here are some of the, the main ones we have up here. Yes, once again, there are carnivores. Um, most of them are the predators. Our turkey vultures also are scavengers. Uh, they eat mainly carrion or roadkill. Our eagles also are scavengers as well at times. Um, they're not too good for that. <laughs> they will happily take what's good and easy to them. And the big thing to remember is that the hunting styles very much vary among all these different species in this family. And that the genuses, Budio and Ascipiter, make up almost half of the species. So Budios are the large, broad-winged, short-tailed birds. They usually have the labored wing beats, and you can usually think of the red-tailed hawk. Our Ascipiters are generally smaller, narrow-tailed, they have short, rapid bursting flaps, usually 
followed by like a glide. And you can think of the, the Cooper's hawk as well. And then our vultures, like we said, uh, they soar up very high. Their wings tend to make the V shape. And as they're circling, they're kind of wobbly. So if you look up there, they're kind of weeble wobbling. Um, and they use their sense of smell to find food, where with our other raptors in this family have those front facing eyes and great vision um, and really strong talons. Our turkey vultures rely on their sense of smell and their talons are not quite as strong, which if you've dabbled in raptors before, know that uh, turkey vultures have been taken in and out of that raptor category, um, but right now they are in. So their turkey vulture, uh, fun fact, they lack the vocal organs to make proper songs. So most of their vocalizations come down to form a low guttural hiss uh, to communicate. And they also have no feathers on their head. Um, that is so when they stick their head in that lovely decaying meat and bring it back out, their feathers aren't going to be matted with rotting meat or bad bacteria that can be growing on it their lovely red head makes it so it can dry faster. Uh, and also these are all found in very variety of landscapes too, the raptors within this family. Please keep in mind that there are also a lot of hawk species that have light and dark morphs. And especially when you add the juveniles into that mix when they're molting or changing colors to their adult plumage, it can be a little tricky and they can look a little different. So awesome job. And our last family, uh, our falcon, falcon a day family with our falcons and caracaras. You all know the drill at this point. Please take a minute and write in the chat window what are some characteristics of these types of birds when you think er, of a falcon. And I'm not going to tell you the two birds on this one. If you think you know what they are, feel free to put them in the chat box as well. Stealthy hunters, smaller and faster speed, a lot of speed happening, it looks like. Once again, the great vision. Speed, yep. So I'll pop these up. Fast flying, speed. <laughs> um, these characteristics, especially with the, the falcons, they're very fast. They have the pointed wing tips, that very streamlined body. A lot of times you will see them hovering and then dropping down on their prey in flight. And then the caracaras are much larger and they tend to be on the ground a lot. So it's one of those things where even though a caracara is in the falcon family, it doesn't really look or act like a falcon. Like I said, they're regularly walking on the ground and to get airborne, they actually have to take a few running steps before they're up into the air. And then once they're in flight, they fly with very strong and slow wing beats with their wings held flat scanning for that prey below. And I have people uh, commented, you are correct. The top is a prairie falcon and the bottom is a crested caracara. That is fantastic. And something interesting to keep in mind is that falcons and parrots actually show common DNA with songbirds, which is pretty cool. And if you like songbirds, we do have a two part songbird passerine identification webinar series coming up next week too so birds are just so amazing great job everyone okay now that we have gone over the main families of the raptors it's time to bring out our handy dandy field guides so this is just a quick overview uh, up here we have the American goldfinch is what's pictured from the field guide and the range map. There are many different kinds of field guides. It doesn't matter. There's Sibley, Kaufman, National Geographic, Audubon, Peterson. It 
whatever one you find easiest to use. And what's really cool is now that we have some apps as well. There's the Merlin app, uh, which is by Cornell. That's the little screenshot right there. It's Sibley. So it's really great. Um, whoo, sorry. <laughs> Accidentally touched my computer screen. All right. So like I said, variety of field guides, whatever works best for you. Um, the first thing is find that family. We just went over the groups of families. See if you can narrow it down and then look for a match. Match the bird to what you saw. And then finally, don't forget the range maps. It's very important when you're learning and using the power of deduction. The different colors represent where the birds breed, non-breeding, and where you can find them year round. They might be different colors and different field guides, and that's okay. We especially remind our summer camp kids how to identify birds. We are always telling them, based on the color of the range map, would we see that bird in Colorado right now? So it's a great thing to, to remember. So when we are looking to the skies for the raptors, most birds of prey fall into the four major categories. Our budios are the large, broad-winged, short-tailed birds with the labored wing beats. You can think of our red-tailed hawk. Our occipiters, which are the small, narrow-tailed um, birds with the short, rapid, bursting flaps of flight punctuated by gliding. Our falcons, which are American Kestra, pe peregrine falcon, they're slender and pointy wing, and they're very fast with the steady wing flaps. And then you can kind of bunch the rest of the birds into big black birds, <laughs> eagles and vultures. They are super big. You usually see them if they're up soaring really high, darker plumed raptors that they don't really use their wings a whole lot. You don't see them constantly flapping. They like to rise up on thermals a lot of times too and do lots of gliding. So with that, focus on the traits you can make out. Like we said, focus on the size, the shape, the overall color or tone, and then the manner of the bird's flight or wing beats. Once you have that, you can think, is it an adult or juvenile? Is it a light or dark morph? The cool thing is most raptors are not sexually dimorphic, which means males and females usually look the same. And a lot of times the female is actually a little bit bigger than the males. So now that you have all of this fantastic information in your brains, <laughs> In the coming slides, we're going to try and ID the raptors. So please do the following. If you know it right away, please give others a chance to look up the bird in their field guide before you write out the answer. If you also don't want to take a chance, uh, if you don't want it spoiled, you can just hide or ignore the chat while you look it up. And remember, just do your best. Unfortunately, the pictures are not to scale and we don't have any videos so you can't tell their flight pattern or their wing beat pattern like you would be able to outside, but just do the best you can and have fun. So get out your field guides or apps, or you can even just go with your instincts and what we've learned about so far and good luck and I will be giving everyone 30 seconds, a minute or so for these birds. Like I said, you can feel free to type it in the window once you've waited a few seconds. All right, here is our first bird. So as you're looking at it, notice what is the shape of it? How is it holding its wings? Can you get it down to a family? Great answers coming in. It looks like everyone is on the same track.
give it another few seconds. I know this might be a little bit easier of a one to start off with. Great. Awesome. So for those of you who answered, Barn Owl, give yourselves a pat on the back. These are some of the characteristics that might have led you to our owl. It's a medium sized owl. It has that beautiful white heart shaped face. It has a spotty or speckly chest with that brown cinnamon color on its back. It has long rounded wings and short tails. And it has that loping kind of like buoyant flight style, which is really fantastic. Oh, Tyler says he saw one fly over his house a couple of weeks ago in the late afternoon. That's awesome if you can find one of these in the wild. Okay, we're gonna get a little harder on the next one, but I have faith. I want you to note that this is a dark morph of this particular bird. So once again, notice, what is its size? What is its shape? Do you notice anything about the colors it has or where those colors are located? Yep, and Tyler just mentioned, which is very true, the field guides do a great job of illustrating the different morphs of raptors. Give everyone just a little bit more time. I know this is a tricky one. And like I said, even if you can figure it out down to the family, that's fantastic. Or maybe the genus. If you think it might be a, an occipiter a versus a budio. All right. So. We're getting there, it is a hawk, yep. <laughs> See, it's all about the little victories that we have. Y'all are doing a great job. If you are, oh, someone just got it. It is our rough-legged hawk, a dark morph. Yes, great job. Like I said, it takes a little time. Uh, here are some characteristics that hopefully led you in that direction or you are on the way. It is a larger hawk, it has broad wings, if you were to see this flying, it tends to face into the wind and hover, uh, stays in one spot for a while, but you can also find it um, perching on poles. In the dark morph, it has the pale flight feathers, giving it that two-toned, and you can also notice the white band in the tail, and it has different amounts of modeling on the back and the wings and the belly. Uh, it's called rough-legged because of the feathers it has down its leg. It kind of twofold, it helps keeps it warm during the winters and it can also protect them, you know, if they go down to grab like a rabbit and it's trying to bite. Um, and someone did ask, what does morph mean? It's just a different color variety. So light and dark and they can look very different. Um, it's once again, that's why I said we have to all give ourselves some grace because learning raptors can be tricky, but it is very rewarding and we're all on the right track. So great job. Here's the next one. Aha. And please note that this is an adult and a juvenile, uh, so they are the same bird. So we'll give you a about 30 seconds or so to come in with your answers. Beautiful. <laughs> this one's just hopefully a little easier um, than our prior Ruffy. It's perfect. 
So we will go right on uh, our bald eagle. Uh, congratulations. It does, as an adult, have those very uh, key identifiers of the white head and the white tail and that brown body. They're very large birds. When you see them up, you're like, oh, that is not a red-tailed hawk. <laughs> um, they have the long, broad wings. The juveniles have the brown body and usually have mottled white over the head and tail. And you can usually have a dark band on the tip of the tail. Uh, we are, like I said, based out at Bar Lake State Park. And if you're in the area, you might have come visit us or seen all the news articles about the hundreds of bald eagles we had. It was a very exciting time. Um, and right now, they've all pretty much paired up and are taking care of their little eaglets. They are nesting right now. So especially on a day like today where it is snowy and cold, we are hoping that they are hunkered down over their little babes and keeping them nice and warm. And fun fact as well is that bald as you can look at their head, they are not bald. It actually means white. So they have that white head, that white tail. And it, do, it will get a little tricky if you have bald eagles and golden eagles overlapping in the same territory, especially with the juvenile bald eagles, sometimes can look like a golden eagle as well. And as a fun fact, yep, which Tyler and I almost said at the same time, it takes about five years for them to get that uh, white head and white tail. Great job, everyone. Okay, here is our next one. Just so you know as well, there is the dark morph of this bird is the one pictured flying and the light morph is the one that is perched. I'll give you a little time as well. Once again, keeping in mind the shape, how it looks in flight, the colors. <laughs> Tyler gave this one away earlier. Yeah, if you remember that, that might be a hint. So once again, these birds are both the same bird. It's just a dark morph above and a light morph below. I love it. We're getting a lot of, a lot of answers up in there. Great. So I love that some people are just coming out with the family that they think it's in or the, the type. So it is a hawk. It is a Swainson's hawk. So Tyler's favorite bird right now. Some characteristics that could have led you to this. It's that dark morph, the one flying. It's two-toned um, appearance from below. It has paler underwing coverts and darker flight feathers. It has long wings with somewhat pointed tips. And you can really see in that bottom picture, it has that hooded or bibbed appearance as well. Um, and once again, you all are doing a fantastic job. Raptors are tricky. This is just the, the top layer. Um, and if we have lots of interest, maybe we will try and host a more in-depth one later on. But just give yourself a lot of grace because you're doing a great job. So our Swainson's Hawk. Okay, this is the big one, and I'll give you more than a minute on this. Here is our big bonus round. We have six different raptors labeled one through six, starting in the top left. Once again, I know it's tricky, especially with the size not being to scale, but just even see if you can get it down to the family. Is it a budio, a sipiter? Is it an owl, an eagle? And like I said, remember, just Take it easy on yourself. Um, so I'll give you a couple minutes to look it through. Like I said, they're numbered up there so you know. And once you think you know, feel free to put the answers up. 
once again, thinking of all those different characteristics of the family that can help you narrow it down and then going through your field guide. I love seeing our answers already roll in, getting them down to that family, that's great. Y'all are getting this. Good job, everyone. And remember, there might be some light morphs or dark morphs in these photos as well. So don't forget to look at those, especially if you're looking in the hawks. Okay, so we will start reading them off. If you are still looking, please continue on, or if you're typing in, please do so. Um, but we will get going on naming some of them. Number one, and I've seen it, is our red-tailed hawk. It's generally pale below with kind of a streaky belly. And on the wing underside, you see a dark bar between that like shoulder and the wrist. So you see that little kind of dark spot up in the up in the wings. And with this picture in particular, you can actually see its red tail. Awesome job if you even just got it to a hawk. Number two is our amazing little American kestrel. They're flying above. Number three is our golden eagle. I saw some of you got that, great job. You can kind of see in this picture how it might look like a juvenile bulb, um, but that is in fact our golden eagle. And if you can ever see the back, the nape of their um, neck on the back, they have this beautiful golden hue to them. Number four, I know number four is very tricky. It is a light morph of a northern goshawk. It is the largest and bulkiest of the occipiters. They have those broad rounded wings and that long tail. And they kind of have long secondary flight feathers that give the trailing edge of the wing kind of like a curved or a bulging look. And they can sometimes look pointed in flight. Number five, is a Cooper's hawk. So all of you said Cooper's or even hawk, great job. It's not a sharp-shinned hawk. They can look very, very similar and they are very tricky to tell apart. But with this Cooper's in flight, uh, its head extends farther past its wings compared to the Sharpie. And it has the white band at the tail tip is also wider on the Coopers. Uh, don't worry if you got that one wrong. Once again, Coopers and Sharpies are very hard to tell apart. Uh, so great job, even if you got it to a hawk. And then finally, number six, I saw Tyler gave a little hint. It, it is an owl that comes out in the daytime. It is our burrowing owl. They're little cute pint-sized owls. You tend to find them out near prairie dog colonies and during the day. So they are diurnal. Awesome, awesome job, everyone. Thank you so much for being vulnerable and putting your answers out there. I know sometimes it can be a little nerve wracking, even if you don't see the people. Birding isn't easy, especially when you are learning raptors. It takes a lot of time and practice. Like we said, they have light and dark morphs. Throw juveniles in there when they are even changing out their plumage to adult plumage. And that equation gives you a really fun challenge. So once again, great job for everyone trying and giving it your best.
All right, so finally we have our raptors and conservation. We've started to get to know the wonderful world of raptors. And I would like you to take a minute and think to yourself, why do they matter? Why should we conserve raptors? And if you would, please write that answer in the chat box and send it for everyone to see. I'll give you about a minute, but think to yourself, why should we help conserve these birds? Yeah, I'm seeing help with ecosystem, rodent control, to eat rabbits. <laughs> they, yep, they can be an indicator species. They keep a balance. Yeah, part of that food chain. They're beautiful. Yep, just beautiful. Fantastic. <laughs> they were here before us. So please keep writing those in. I will pop up some of these things. These are all amazing answers that you are giving. And the great thing is, is that there are already laws and amazing organizations working extremely hard to make sure that raptors stay with us. Uh, the Migratory Bird Treaty Act of 1918, it is our oldest wildlife protection. It basically protects birds from people because a number of birds were on the brink of extinction due to hunting for sport or for feathers. So it says we cannot hunt or pursue, wound, kill, collect, import, export, migratory birds, their nest, parts of feathers. You might think to yourself, well, then how does the Bird Conservancy or our museums have uh, mounts or feathers? Uh, they do have it in there that if you have a permit by the Secretary of the Interior that you are allowed to have those. A lot of times it revolves around educational facilities. But if you're just out walking in the woods and you find a beautiful eagle feather, you can pick it up, take a picture, enjoy it, but make sure you leave it back down. And in 1962, they also updated it so that Native American tribes can collect feathers for religious ceremonies. Uh, you might have heard the Migratory Bird Treaty Act in the news a bit more, so you can look more into that as well. A couple of really well-known organizations like the Raptor Research Foundation and the Peregrine Fund, they do research, educational programming, citizen science, all to help conserve these raptors, not only uh, here, but worldwide. The Global Raptor Impact Network, which is a function of Peregrine Fund, says that more than half of the world's raptor species have declining populations and nearly 20% are threatened with extinction. The beautiful kestrel, the American kestrel that I have pictured here, is actually one of the more common raptors that we see, but their numbers are declining and we don't know why. So people are working together. We're using biologists and scientists and citizen science to go out and try and figure out what is going on so we can continue to help protect them. There's also great organizations like Nature's Educators, Birds of Prey, many more locally. All you have to do is, you know, Google and see what's around you that might use non-releasable raptors as an ambassador for their species to educate the public as well on these amazing uh, creatures. At the end of the day, and like we said, they're also essential to ecosystems and I love all the things that everyone has been writing in. Um, it's our responsibility to help keep these beautiful birds around and I feel very confident with all the reasons you gave and everything happening um, with different organizations, even like ours, that we will be able to help conserve these animals. So finally, I just want to say thank you. Thank you, thank you so much for spending your morning with us and learning and challenging yourself. Um, I hope you learned something new and I challenge you to tell someone uh, if it's someone you live with, maybe even write a letter, <laughs> something new that you learned in this webinar um, to hopefully share your growing love of raptors. So there are a few different ways you can keep in touch with us. Facebook, we have daily nature challenges um, and webinars, almost weekly webinars right now. That's really the main hub where what's 
most up to date will be happening on there, especially under the event page. Our website, like I said, our organization does amazing things, lots of different things. So feel free to dive in there. And our email, education at birdconservancy.org. If you have any questions or comments or things that you think we can do better with these webinars, um, feel free to send us an email. If you have certain topics you would love for us to cover, please feel free to uh, send them there as well. We're always looking how to grow and evolve in this new time. And like I had said earlier, we do have um, a passerine or songbird two-part series webinar coming up. Um, we even have some fun little shorter webinars for our littles, so ages three to five, that are happening where it's usually a storybook and some fun little uh, call to action. And there is just also uh, a whole lot of information we'll be putting out more advanced things too, so let us know what's going on. Um, thank you all again. If you have any questions, Tyler and I will be staying on the chat room, so we are more than happy to answer them, but I hope you all stay safe, happy, and healthy, and happy birding. That's awesome, Eric, that you used to do hikes around the wind farms and you hadn't seen any dead birds out there. That's really great. Hopefully they've learned to steer clear. Hi, Anne. <laughs> Thank you. So one of the reasons why we shouldn't collect the feathers, and this is uh, very specifically with the migratory birds as well, um, it's, they are protected under that Migratory Bird Treaty Act. So if it's any of the birds that we just went over today, it's, it's off limits. And the reason was they think that if you were to take that feather, you wouldn't necessarily know where it came from. You wouldn't know if maybe you were out hunting and you got that feather. Um, so that's one of the reasons why it's that tricky line where they wouldn't be able to tell. And in terms of just general songbirds and um, other non-migratory birds, my personal opinion is you just, you just let, it, let it be, leave it in nature so that other people can enjoy it as well. Yep, and like Leah said as well, feathers used to be used for fashion. The snowy egret was almost hunted to extinction because of that. So it's just that distinction of not knowing where you got that feather for or what you're collecting them for. Yep, and like Tyler said, there's a lot of research going on right now about wind farms, how they're affecting migrating birds. Um, I know bats as well. Yes, a great book, The Feather Thief. I have not read that yet, but I've heard great things. Is the Bird Conservancy consulting with the park team at Stanley Lake about the bald eagle mom, dad, babies, and the floater? Maya, I am not sure about that. I don't know if Tyler knows or if our education director, Sherry, is still on here. But if you email us, um, we will be able to hopefully find you an answer. I know that we obviously do our eagle nest watches, but I'm not sure how much communication happens. Yeah, Tyler just said, I don't believe that we are, but there's a great article on that nest.
Oh, and the articles on the Facebook page. Yep, the IMBT doesn't distinguish between live and dead, so it's anything bird related. <laughs> All right. Well, it looks like that's about it. Thank you all for your questions and your uh, discussions. Like I said, if you have anything lingering, feel free to email us. Uh, and this will be up on YouTube in the next day or two as well. Oh, yep. Another great book. Raptors in the air. More pictures from below. Yep. Good note. Thank you. All right. Thank you, everyone, so much. We'll see you next time.